The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. It's still Easter, isn't it? Every Sunday. Every Sunday we live in the reality of a victorious risen Lord. Amen? So last week, um, we, we kicked off a series uh, aptly titled Victory on, on Easter morning, and we're going to take what we talked about on, on, uh, on Easter and walk it through practically for the next six or seven weeks. Uh, but last week, we talked about the ultimate victory, because an empty tomb equals victory for us. Amen? Because we, we celebrate a Lord who has risen from the dead, which means he's defeated death and everything that underwrites death, the sin, the guilt, the condemnation, estrangement from God, all that was conquered when Jesus rose. And why that's not just great for Jesus, but great for us, is the whole gospel story that we get to make this crazy unfair exchange by faith if we give Jesus our guilt our death, our condemnation, Jesus takes it for us. All we got to do is confess it. I'm not right, God. I'm far from you, God. I need a Savior. And Jesus takes all our garbage, all our junk, and he gives us instead his life, his resurrection life, his status as a son, all of his blessings he gives to you. Not when you die, but now. And that's why it's such amazing news. That's why it's victory upon victory. Because when we put our faith in Jesus, there's no more hell, no more death, no more estrangement, no more guilt hanging on our necks. We are sons and daughters of God. Amen? Now, if I took a poll and said, how many all believe this? I think every hand, most hands would go up. But if I say, how many all feel this? That's a different poll. Less hands would go up. Hi, you all know you're victorious. I, I've heard the amens, and I know that you all love the gospel and believe in it, or most of you here, and if you're new to the church and new to Christianity, totally cool. You're here to, to just wa- watch and observe, but I think most of you who, who have heard about Jesus and know what he offers, it's a good thing, but, but to live in victory, to feel it, it's, it's a whole different thing matter. And so this week and for the next six, we're going to unpack it practically. What does it mean to live in victory every day? What does that actually look like? And it all starts here, in the mind. Because if it's true that you are what you eat, and my trainer scared me and said, you'll die soon if you don't change what you eat, because 50% of you is made of (laughs) Chick-fil-A. The other 50 is in and out. Um, If that's true, it's certainly true you are what you think. Because everything about your life, whatever you say, do, act, flows downstream from this three-pound organ inside your skull. These are the headwaters. Everything is, is, it begins with your thoughts, with your mind. And so if we're going to live in victory, it's got to start with victorious thoughts, I had coaches as I played sports, the few sports I played, they would say, if you think you'll lose, you've already lost. And they're more right than they ever knew. Okay, because truly, if you are what you think and if you've already are defeated, you've already lost. And how many of us, as much as we celebrate the victory we have in Jesus and we believe the gospel and we know all that's true, we're hijacked by terrible thoughts, defeated thoughts, sinful thoughts that compromise our so-called victory. Listen to what Paul has to say about this. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 10. And just for some context here, Paul is battling for the minds of his believers in Corinth. He planted that church. And if you look at the heading over chapter 10, it's Paul's defense of his ministry because there were all these false teachers and all these critics of Paul, people who were more polished and could stand straighter and taller and speak with rhetoric. They were all trying to diminish Paul and diminish his gospel. And here is Paul fighting for the minds of his believers. Starting at verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You pray with me? Lord, that's our heart. 
We want our thoughts captive to you, Jesus. Because here is this incredible, um, seemingly contradiction, but a divine paradox that when our minds are captive to you, we're truly free. And we know that, God. We want our thoughts captive to you, Jesus. We want our thoughts obedient to you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you speak through me, not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit, says the Lord. And we need your Holy Spirit to open up hearts, open up ears, open up eyes to see you, God. I beg that of you for our people, for me. May the words I'm about to speak reach good soil. I pray this in your name. Amen. So... Paul wants this for his church, and I think he'll want this for our church, that we war, we battle for our minds. And so uh, a few takeaways. Number one, and I'm going to speak on this this week and next, because there's too much content to unpack in one sermon. Um, So I'll take the first half of this passage, second half uh, next week. But here's the first takeaway for me, that our mental victory requires warfare. Ooh, that's a spooky picture. (laughs) Our mental victory requires warfare. Uh, If you read that passage, it's clear that Paul thinks we're at war. He talks about war, literally. He talks about weapons, demolishing, strongholds, captives. He is using wartime language to tell us that that we're in a battle for our minds, that victory for our minds require warfare. And if 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 you think back to last week, you might think that Paul's speaking out both sides of his mouth. Because last week we looked at Romans 8, which Paul also penned. And he said we're victorious. We're more than conquerors, yet we have to fight. We're victorious, the battle's over, and yet there's still a war. How does does that make sense? And that brought me back to Romans 8. I read these verses. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Christ. It doesn't say shall hot tubs and mansions and Ferraris and stacked wallets. No, he says shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. And then Paul answers, no, in all these things, notice that. He's saying, no, you'll never face those things. He says, no, in all these things, he's assuming we're going to have versions of that in our lives. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, I forgot to read it carefully. (laughs) I thought Paul's proclaiming a victory like there's no more battle. There's no more struggling. There's no more strife. It is just hot tub after hot tub for me. (laughs) But he says, no, your victory is within the battles. Like, you need to assume the persecution, the hardship, the trouble, the nakedness, the sword. And the victory is that even within those battles, you already know the conclusion. That none of these things can separate you from the love of God. Not only that, but these things will push you deeper into the love of God. And that even if Satan were to touch your life, it just brings you right to the heart of God. There is no battle that you'll face that you cannot win. That's the more than conquer piece, not that you won't fight battles. In God's sovereign mystery, he leaves us on a broken planet to work out our salvation over 70 to 80 years, fighting these battles for him. And in that process, cultivating faith and character and winning souls. And so even built into last week's passage is this profound and if not disturbing truth that our victory is within the fight, not absent of the fight. Does that make sense? So he's not speaking out both sides of his mouth. He's saying, you've won, now fight. You're victorious, now fight the battles God has sovereignly ordained to be in your life. You'll win them all, if you trust me, but you're going to have to fight. And the fight starts with the fight for the mind. As we fight, how many of you know that a defeated enemy is still a dangerous enemy? A defeated enemy can still be dangerous. Even though the enemy knows he's defeated, he'll try to cause a lot of collateral damage. Have you all heard of D-Day? Next slide. If you know any U.S. history, this was the decisive battle that broke the back of the Nazis. The Nazis at that time had occupied most of, if not controlled most of Western Europe. There were a few bastions 
of, of Allied holdouts, but they pretty much were on the brink of total victory until the U.S. Uh, joined the Allied forces because of Pearl Harbor, and, uh, and then they decided to have this one counterattack. They put all their marbles in this basket, and, uh, and they landed on the shores of Normandy. Um, the date was uh, June 6, 1944. They, the Nazis were caught unprepared. There were some, you know, some covert operations that, that um, made the Nazis think that the invasion would be somewhere else. Thank God they were convinced of that. There was bad weather, so they, they had no idea they would actually land on that day. Uh, but the Allied forces came in strong numbers uh, on the shores of France, and they pushed down. And when the Nazis realized this was happening, it was too late. It broke the back of the Nazis. And from that point on, it was a fairly straightforward march to Germany. There were parades of civilians welcoming the Allied forces because they knew, and even the Germans knew, the war was over. But how many of you know that even a defeated enemy can be a dangerous enemy? And so as they're walking through parades, it's basically a mop-up operation. They get to Germany, and Hitler, in his insane, evil rage, decides, I'm going to mess them up as much as I can. And he launches what's called the Battle of the Bulge. 450,000 Nazi troops, basically all he had left. 1,500 tanks were unleashed upon mainly American forces as they entered Germany. And thus, the Battle of the Bulge, the second bloodiest battle in World War II, the, uh, the greatest battle the U.S. faced in World War II, the second ever in U.S. history, 90,000 U.S. casualties, 20,000 killed. And all this when the war was over. All this when the outcome of the war had been determined the U.S. faces the greatest number of kills and casualties they faced in that entire war. A defeated enemy is still a dangerous enemy because the enemy hates the fact that you've won and will do all he can to diminish your victory. That's Satan's objective in your life. The battle has been won in that Satan cannot send you to hell. Praise God. Satan has lost in that he can never estrange you permanently from God. You are always God's son, always. No matter how much Amanda makes me mad, she's my girl. That won't change. Likewise, because of Jesus Christ, because of the, the grave and the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection, we are always children of God. Satan cannot touch that, and he can't touch our eternal destiny. You all happy about that? But here's what Satan can do. He can frustrate that. He can diminish that. He can cause some casualties in this life and in the next. In this life, he can lie to you and deceive you and tempt you so that you voluntarily walk away from God. Think of the prodigal son. I know the devil's not mentioned in that story. But it's, it's a parable about our relationship with God, so you can easily read the devil into it. But the father never changed. He was a good father when the son was at home. He certainly was a good father when the son came back. The father didn't change. Who changed? The son. Somewhere a lie formed in his head. My dad is so stuffy. Life is so boring here. I can't do anything I want. To the point where it gestates until he curses his father to his face, grabs his dad's money, and then squanders it in the wilderness for what we think are years, until he hits rock bottom in the pig pen, and then comes back to the same father that he remembers is good. Now notice, the devil can't touch the relationship. The father's still waiting for his son, because that never changed. The son went back to the father, because that never changed. But what did Satan do? He caused years of brokenness, years of poverty, years of living below his station. You know that we are princes and princesses of God, and yet the devil can convince us to live as paupers, as beggars, as orphans, even though we're royalty? So the son sells his robe, sells his signet ring, sells his sandals. He's still the son, but he's, he's lost so much, and he can't get back those years of, of prodigal sin, but he can be restored, thank God. He can be redeemed, thank God, but he's lost those years. 
and there's cascading effects because he certainly ticked off his older brother. (laughs) Satan can do that. He can lie to you and deceive you and tempt you so that this precious intimacy you have with God, you can walk away from. But what's worse is not only can he touch your present, he can rob from your future. There is a judgment upon us believers. Not one of heaven or hell. Thank God that's been settled. But one of rewards. It's mentioned all throughout the Bible. Jesus mentions it. The, Paul, the epistles mention it, that there are eternal consequences to our decisions as children of God. And you will be rewarded based on your faith. This is not some mercenary reward where you get a bag of money, you get a big mansion up on a hill. If you didn't believe, you get like a shack on the bottom. That's not how it works. There's no ghettos in heaven. It's all about glory. The only currency in heaven, when the streets are made of gold, is Glory. It's joy, deeper levels of joy. And what the Bible talks about is that if you spend your life cultivating a bigger and bigger capacity for God, you get filled and you overflow. So for those of us who by faith have lived at depriving ourselves of sin, of flesh, of earthly pleasures to maximize God on earth, when you get to heaven, you bring an ocean tanker ready to get filled. Some of us are going to just barely be saved. And you give some time to God. You know you love him, but you're just so distracted and so pulled by so many idols and and so much sin in your life. And yeah, in the end, God forgives you because the cross made the final statement, but you're coming up with a little bit of faith, a little thimble. And Jonathan Edwards, this brilliant Christian philosopher and theologian, says, hey, it's like throwing all these different vessels into the Pacific Ocean. It all gets filled, but to varying amounts. And so for some, greater will be their joy. Everyone will be happy, but some will be really, really, really happy. And here's the crazy thing. You get 80 years, some of you, less, some of you more, to determine the next quadrillion years of joy. And here's what Satan would love to do, is have you so distracted, have you chase useless ladders, pursue useless trophies and trinkets, so that he can shrink your faith down to a little symbol and rob you of the joy and the reward you can have for eternity. Can the devil do some stuff? Absolutely. Is he still a dangerous enemy? Absolutely. If I told you, if I told you, if I'm a police officer and I knocked on your door and said, hey, We've been picking up, uh, and I, I don't know police language. I'm just going to imagine this. I, we're picking up some activity in your neighborhood. There's a crime syndicate um, that uh, there's reports saying they're going to hit every house here on this block. It's just a matter of a week. Well, you go, oh, thanks. And return, return to Netflix? No, you're going to Costco. You're buying the ring. You're buying multiple security systems. Is that what it's called, the ring with the camera? Something like that, right? You're, you're, you're getting guns, maybe, bats, something. Every noise, you're like, what, what is that? <laughs> because you know the enemy's coming. And did not Jesus say, be on guard, be on watch? He comes. He will come to rob, steal, kill, destroy. And so it says uh, in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Ephesians 6.11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Friends, if Paul is correct and it takes a battle to fight for our minds and we have an enemy who wants nothing more than to diminish your victory until it's, there's little left and the promise in scripture is that he's coming like a lion. He's coming like a thief. He's coming to steal from you. Every day you wake up facing war. It's a wartime mentality. You're not at peace. This is the tension we live in. The battle's been won, but you fight every day. The end, the conclusion is clear, but you're walking across Germany, not through Disneyland. You wake up knowing someone's coming to steal something. It's you're vigilant. You're on guard because God has given you something so precious you don't want to lose an ounce of it. It's a wartime mentality, friends. 
That's what it takes to be victorious in your mind. Second point, our mental victory is fought for differently. Paul contrasts in our passage that the way the world fights these mental battles is very different than the way we as believers of Jesus fight. The way the world fights for our minds, um, we are familiar with their tactics because we face them all the time. Sometimes beautiful thoughts that are compelling come to us through charisma, right? Someone with charm, uh, with personality, with, with just electricity like me. <laughs> Thank you for that laughter. Yeah. No, I'm the opposite of charisma. Like, think of someone where they come up, you know, big, booming voice, like a Tony Robbins. Anyone see the Netflix special on Tony Robbins or have been to a Tony Robbins seminar? I mean, this guy is like six, seven, two widths of me, booming voice. Sometimes it's charisma. Uh, sometimes it's brilliance, just high IQ, academic credentials. They're saying things that you don't understand, but you know, you're like, that's smart. Um, ubiquity, what I mean by that, it's everywhere. You're hearing it all the time. It's almost viral. It's on everyone's lips. It's on everyone's phone. Just, you hear it everywhere. It's power. People with, with many zeros in their accounts, people who are high up in the ladder, when they say something, you tend to listen. Sometimes it's seduction through the form of music or cinema or just the package of the person speaking is very attractive, and so you're like, ooh, I, I want some of that. I want to lean into that thought. And Paul's contending with all this as he's defending his gospel. He's got all these enemies who are using brilliance. What they say seems so sophisticated and smart. They're using charisma, like unlike Paul, who was, uh, who was small, who had weak eyesight. So he's reading like this. The letters say that, hey, Paul, your letters are really forceful, but, but in person, you suck. That's what they literally told Paul. To his, I mean, gosh, he's an apostle. And so he's facing all these real worldly tactics that the world is using to get your minds. And, and it's, listen, it's powerful. You know how I know it's powerful? Because I've been in L.A. and I eat quinoa now. <laughs> and my clothes have gotten skinnier because of constant messaging the ubiquity of it and the power of it and my wife's very powerful voice <laughs> in my life. The world fights dirty. You know, I, I was um, driving, listening to a song, just kind of flipping through things, and it has a good lick, good rhythm. Just, it's a familiar song to me that I had, you know, thoughts about and memories of, and I'm just grooving to it. And all of a sudden, I'm picturing myself top down in a Ferrari, driving down the PCH to my mansion in Malibu so I can exit the, the Ferrari to go into an infinity pool, then to my hot tub, and then just, you know, it's like I'm thinking through all this, and I'm like, I'm in a minivan. I'm a pastor. Did I just make the wrong choice? I'm chasing these thoughts. I'm thinking to myself, where, where am I? Like, what is happening? It's that song. <laughs> wow, I had just the... The music, the beat, the lyrics, it puts me in a mindset where I hate Jesus and I don't want to be a pastor anymore. All within three minutes, the seductive power of the world. How do you fight this, guys? How do you fight brilliance and charisma and the ubiquity of the messaging and, 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 the, and the, the seductiveness and all that? How do you fight that? Well, the Bible says... We don't fight like the world. We fight with different weapons. Namely, there's really just one. And I'll tell you why Paul uses the plural in just a bit, but there's really one. Um, if you turn uh, to Ephesians 6, 17 to 18, it says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword. This is the only weapon mentioned uh, in the arsonry of spiritual warfare. The first number of things are all defense, but here's the one weapon. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. 
In other words, the world can come at you all different ways, academically, seductively, with power, with charisma, so sophisticated, it just seems so appealing. And we have one weapon. All we got is this, the truth, the Word of God. And for those who put their faith in the Word of God, all the arguments of the world is like just waves crashing upon the rock. Can't move it. It'll peel away. Because this is eternal truth. So simple, yet so profound, that the world can array all kinds of weapons against us, but we just need one. The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How many of you know enough word to fight? Because this the Bible says, this is the sword of the Spirit, of the, which is the Word of God. This is your weapon. How many of you know enough word to fight? Because listen, the temptations that came at me were very specific. Red Ferrari, top down, mansion, PCH, Malibu, Whirlpool, Infinity, all that. I can't fight that with just for God so loved the world. Satan comes with heat-seeking missiles exactly to your weaknesses. And if you don't have a word that's also specific and strong and tangible to you, you're fighting arrows with fog. How much of this word do you know to fight? Next point. Next slide. Your sword is only as big as your knowledge of the word. If you're working with three verses, this is what you got going on. <laughs> How many of you want this when you face a lion? <laughs> because by the point you, you can, this is relevant, his fangs are up in your face. You can poke him with this. I mean, seriously, like Satan comes at you with lust. I forgot so loved the world. God so loved the world. <laughs> but this is the reality. Your sword is only as big as the amount of word in your heart. When Satan came after, the, uh, when Satan came after Jesus, Satan tempted Jesus in 4D. Word, visual, smells. That's what Satan does. I mean, dirty Jesus hadn't eaten, drank for 40 days, and Satan puts up the Sizzler's buffet in front of Jesus. And Jesus had a specific word, but not, not depending on bread, but on the, on the bread of God, on the word of God. When it came to glory, Jesus had a specific word about that. When it came to power, Jesus had a specific word about that. You could see from the way Jesus fought. Listen, he didn't fight with this. He fought with this. <laughs> Reminds me of a Crocodile Dundee movie. You call that a knife? Listen. <laughs> now, this is actually the Sword of Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, the uh, Amazon plastic version of it. <laughs> but now you can fight a battle. In your hands, on one side, is uh, 54 promises of God. Just take 30 seconds and read through some of those. These all come from Scripture. They're summaries of promises, just 54 out of hundreds. Imagine if you had some of these percolating through your system. Imagine if your heart was full of these promises. And Satan comes at you. And every time he tries to attack, you have a promise of God to hold him back, to cut his throat if necessary. Your sword is only as big as your knowledge of his word. You do not want to fight with this, with two verses that you know vaguely. You need a lot of scripture to fight the way Satan, against Satan and the way he fights. But listen, having a big sword is one thing. Man, this is the problem with props. Once you have them, like, it's like, all right. <laughs> having a big sword is one thing. 
but it does nothing if it's just sitting there. Okay, and, and I could memorize 54 verses, but if I don't have faith for it, it's, it doesn't change the fact that this is real. God's word is true regardless of whether you believe it or not, but it's useless to you. Literally, listen, if, if, this, if, this, if you have no faith in this, all you can do is hit people with it. That's your, get away. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, great, the worst attacks of the devil aren't necessarily in, in a form where you can slap with the Bible. Okay. Our battle is against flesh and blood. Or not against flesh and blood, but against the demonic, against the spirit. And so, um, in order for us to grip the sword, we have to have faith. We need to have faith because you cannot pick up what you don't believe. You cannot pick up what you don't believe. So if I have this verse in my head, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's just a factoid. It's lifeless. It's useless. But if I start meditating on that word and believing in it, I, me, broken Dihan, uniquely me, this is not a general verse, this is directly to me, can do all things, not just the good things, but even the tough things, even suffer, even go through trials, even face hardship, even be sick. I can do all things through Christ. He's not far from me, but he's in me. I don't have to reach out for him. He is in me. He's already in me. And this, this Christ is giving me his resurrection power right now. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm strong in Jesus. I'm strong. And now that verse is in me. I believe it. I've unpacked it. I've applied it. And so when the devil tries to smear my face in weakness, I can shout that verse with confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But that verse is not useful until you've chewed on it and you've swallowed it and it's become a party. That's called meditation. Meditation means like a literal chewing, a mulling over a word until it becomes life to you. Because notice, it doesn't say the sword, which is bare text from the Bible. It says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit's got to take those words and put them into you until there's faith for those words. And then you can pick up the sword when you believe those promises. But how many of you read the Bible long enough where it actually becomes a part of you? Where you chew it and swallow it until it's life enough where you trust it? Because those verses are lifeless until you trust them. So you put faith into them. They're just words. The devil can quote those same promises, but they don't believe in them, and they don't delight in them. But you want a sword you can do something with? You've got to meditate on You know, listen, I heard, some, I heard a horrible, horrible thing, that there's people who chew their food and, and, and spit it out. What a nightmare! It offends me deeply. I read some models who are, you know, about to hit the runway. They, they so eat, want to eat a cheeseburger, and they'll chew it and spit it out just for the taste. Oh, my Lord. That's why they're so skinny, okay? Because they do silly things like that. But how many of us do the same thing? You barely have enough time to chew, let alone swallow. You get into the Bible just enough, and then you close it, without enough time for those words to actually come and do anything inside you. Lifeless. Useless. When, when that PCH attack came to me, and I was on the 405, I think it wasn't anywhere near the PCH, but when that attack came, I had to go back to a verse I have put faith in. I remember on the mission field, um, I was asked to carry the cross, literally. Like, it was a giant life-size cross. And we were supposed to carry it around the compound uh, as a way of, like, praying for the mission base. This is on a Navajo reservation. And, uh, and I volunteered. And, of course, being a guy, I'm like, I'm going to carry this till my back breaks and carry it longer than anyone else has carried it. So I'm carrying this giant cross uh, around the compound. And I remember I just recited Philippians 3, 7 through 11, over and over in my soul. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, 
for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider it rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of, of gaining Christ. I, I, I would recite that over and over until it was burned into my soul. And now, and whenever I read that verse or hear that verse, I think of the red cliffs of New Mexico and that cross and, and just the joy and the intimacy I felt, strangely, carrying his cross. And so when those temptations come, I am reciting a verse I have chewed on and swallowed that came from a deep place in my life that reminds me all this stuff, the PCH, the mansion, all that's great, but doesn't compare to Jesus. And when I say those words, that false vision dissolves. And I need that for every attack. I need the promises of God to be chewed on, to be swallowed, to be lived off of. So now you picked up your sword. Let's say it's a big one. How do you actually use it? And this is where I never made this connection, but if you actually look at the passage, can you show that verse? It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and notice right after, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. This is what I hear from the way Paul writes, is that if you have developed a sword, you pick it up by faith, by meditation. Now, here's how you slash through prayer. Pray in the Spirit and all, the same Spirit which allows you to meditate on His Word, now unleash that in swordplay. Fight. When the devil came after Jesus, Jesus didn't just passively take it in, say nothing. But how many of us are mute when the devil attacks? Jesus spoke back to the devil. He spoke, and he spoke it, this is all the spirit realm. It's a form of prayer. You're declaring in faith what you've meditated on in prayer. You're speaking back to the devil, speaking against that temptation in faith. It says pray in the Spirit on all occasions when you're driving, when you're raising your kids, when you're going to work, when you're stuck in a long checkout line at the grocery store and you're tempted to curse at somebody, all that. It doesn't literally mean fold your hands and, and pray. It just means declare in faith out loud. If you're like, well, that's weird. Well, let me tell you what the reality is for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So if our battle is not against just physical beings, but against the spirit realm, then prayer is the warfare. You're praying into the spirit realm to say, no, Satan, you can't have this. No, that's a lie, Satan. Here's the truth. You declare that. You declare that. So here's the one way we fight, guys. You read your Bible, meditate on it until it becomes a sword in your hands and you wield it through prayer. How many of you know enough word and have put enough faith in the promises of God's word and declare it loudly enough to fight? How many of us just passively take in the temptation? Passively take in the attacks and you do nothing. No wonder we are losing. I, I um, read an account of, of one of my favorite pastors, a uh, godly man, except that um, when he prepares his sermon, he comes under unusual attack. He says that during his sermon preparation, he'll get random lustful images in his head, terrible ones. He doesn't know where it comes from. It's only when he's preparing for his sermons. He said, man, if the devil's going to fight dirty, I'm going to fight right back. And as he's writing, he'd go, no, devil, no. <laughs> Literally. He'll say, he'll picture Jesus on the bloody cross. He's like, you're bleeding for me, Jesus. The crown of thorns. Like he's shouting stuff to get the visuals out of his head. I am a holy temple. He's shouting, no, Satan, no. And his kids are like, does my dad have Tourette's? Like what is... <laughs> I was so impressed by that because so many of us would just let it sit, let it wash over us, think somehow maybe it'll go away. It will not go away. When a lion sniffs prey, he does not go away. You got to get one of these. 
And, and, and listen, <laughs> listen, you know what's cool? If you meditate on God's word, it's a constant flow through you. It's like straight up like, the devil sees this, and you preemptively stop him from coming at you. I mean, when you've got a warrior doing this, I, I, I'm Asian, but I don't know what to do with this, okay? <laughs> but when you're flashing your sword back and forth, in my weakness, Christ's strength is made perfect, just over and over, you, you know, you know the devil's going to take a step back and be like, I mean, he's a little too hard. I'm going to go over this one over here. <laughs> but my point is, listen, it's not for this one pastor who's shouting like he's got Tourette's, Okay. Um, it's, it's for all of us. We got to talk back to Satan. And maybe not even to Satan. Yesterday at the men's breakfast, I'm not going to share any details. Don't worry, gentlemen. Don't worry, Sharif. <laughs> but there was a story told um, of, of, um, of how some of our brothers fight in life. They have to look in a mirror and preach to themselves. It's not even Satan they're fighting. They're fighting their own broken, guilty conscience, their own broken sense of identity. They have to, so, so you're a son of God. And, and my, this one brother said he had to sometimes look down because he's so ashamed to say it. And there's this battle to preach to his own soul the promises of God, to talk back to our own broken flesh. Because there's so much messaging in the opposite direction. Not even just from Satan. Satan just winds the toy and we just start going, nah, nah, nah. You know what I'm saying? Like we do it to ourselves. How many of you talk back? Your parents tell you never to talk back, but I'm telling you today, God wants you to talk back to your enemy. Talk back, fight. Don't passively let Satan win. Not the full battle, but these even smaller battles that really matter. Would you do this with me? So next week, I'm going to talk about the rest, demolishing of strongholds, all that good stuff. There's a lot I want to unpack there. But today, look at this sheet. By the way, I forgot to mention, on the other side is something called Lectio Divina. It's an ancient way of meditation. The top half is for you. The bottom half, if you ever do it in a group, you can read through that. But um, read that later. Flip back to the promises. Here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> Worship team, come on up. Um, I want you to take a moment and reflect on what the devil has been trying to steal from you lately. How has he been coming against you? How has he been attacking you? And as you bring that to mind, let your eyes scan over these promises and pick one that addresses that attack. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Think through the, how the devil's coming after you and pick one promise. And if you even want to look it up, because these are just summaries, if you want to actually read the verse um, in your soul or out loud, just declare that promise over yourself a few times, okay? I'm going to have us respond uh, in worship, but before we do, if we can stand together.